It's not uncommon to hear patients say to a contact lens professional, I can't wear soft contact lenses because I have astigmatism. The good news is that excellent soft toric lenses have existed for a number of years. The bad news is that patients and even some contact lens professionals are unaware of how successfully they can correct astigmatism. Not only do good toric soft lenses exist, good disposable toric lenses exist. This course will help you better understand these lenses so you can share the good news with your patients. At what point should a contact lens professional begin to think about fitting a soft lens candidate with soft toric lenses instead of a spherical lens? A good rule of thumb is to consider any soft lens candidate who has three-quarter diopters of refractive astigmatism a candidate for soft toric lenses. There may be reasons to choose another lens design later, but initially think soft torics whenever three-quarter diopters of astigmatism is present, as in this example. While all patients with at least three-quarter diopters of refractive astigmatism should initially be considered a candidate for soft toric lenses, there are some patients who are ideal soft toric lens candidates. This is the case with patients who have against-the-rule corneal cylinder. What do we know about against-the-rule astigmatism? These corneas have the flattest meridian running vertically while the steepest meridian is horizontal. Oxygen permeable lenses will always follow the steepest meridian since it offers the least amount of resistance. For those patients that have with the rule corneal astigmatism, this is perfect because the steepest meridian is vertical. So when the patient blinks, the lens follows the vertical meridian as the lid pulls it up and then drops it back down into place. However, when a cornea has against the rule astigmatism, when the eyelid blinks, the lens wants to follow the path of least resistance, which is now horizontal. It has a harder time moving freely up and down since that is the flatter meridian and offers the greatest amount of resistance. This causes the lens to decenter and may cause more awareness and staining of the cornea. So while patients displaying with the rule astigmatism can wear soft toric lenses, those patients that have against the rule astigmatism are great candidates due to their increased challenges with oxygen permeable lenses. Another ideal soft toric contact lens candidate is the patient with internal astigmatism. When astigmatism is present on the surface of the cornea, a rigid lens can directly impact it, neutralizing it by creating a smooth, regular optical surface. But when the astigmatism is the result of irregular curves found on the crystalline lens, posterior surface of the cornea, or another internal optical element, a rigid lens loses its advantage over a soft lens. Let's look at an example of how it can be determined if the patient has an internal element of astigmatism. Let's assume the patient has a refraction of minus 4, minus 1.5, axis 180. This patient has 1.5 diopters of refractive or total astigmatism. If the keratometer readings are 42 at 180 by 42 and a quarter at 90, it indicates that the patient has one quarter diopters of corneal astigmatism. By comparing the two values, it becomes apparent that while one quarter diopters of the total astigmatism is present on the cornea, there is an additional one and a quarter diopters of astigmatism that must be somewhere else in the optical system. Just as there are ideal candidates for software contact lenses, there are more challenging candidates. This is not to imply that these patients cannot be fit with soft toric lenses. Certainly they can. However, it is important to understand why they are more challenging so that the patient as well as the contact lens professional can be prepared. Every time a patient blinks, a contact lens is pushed nasally because of the force of the lids. After enough blinks, it can completely turn around. Given the unique nature of the power in the soft toric lens, that can create havoc for the patient. Imagine astigmatic lenses in a pair of spectacles that spin around with every blink. It's not hard to understand how distracting that vision would be. So, soft toric lenses need to be stabilized on the eye in order to prevent rotation and keep vision clear. There are a number of different methods of stabilization. Prism ballast. Back surface toric designs. Double slab off lenses and some lenses are designed with a combination of these stabilization methods. Prism ballast designs incorporate a gradual increase in the thickness towards one edge of the lens, which aids in lens orientation. This is a very stable way to orient a soft toric contact lens. 
Another type of stabilization method is the back surface toric. Orientation with the back surface toric lens is accomplished by aligning the toric back curves of the lens with the astigmatic curves on the front of the cornea. This method works particularly well on the highly astigmatic cornea. Yet another method of soft toric lens stabilization is using double slab off. These double thin zones orient the lens by positioning the thicker portion of the lens between the lids and the thinner zones under the eyeballs. Common sense dictates that it would be a very comfortable lens method of stabilization. Lenses with this type of stabilization are beneficial to use on patients with tight lids or narrow fissures or lid openings. So, how do you fit a soft toric contact lens? Let's walk through the steps of determining the base curve, diameter, and lens power. We'll start with the basics. Base curve and diameter. Well, it couldn't be simpler. Because the base curve and diameter should be chosen just as they would be in a spherical soft lens. There are many different methods for determining which base curve and diameter to use on single vision spherical lenses. Some contact lens professionals fit the flattest lens that remains stable on the cornea. Others follow a nomogram that subtracts three or four diopters from the flattest keratometer reading. Others will fit average corneas with the middle base curve offered by their favored lens design. Steeper corneas with the steeper lens choice and flatter corneas with the flattest choice. Still, others will take into account the corneal diameter along with the keratometer readings to arrive at the proper base curve choice. For diameter, it is considered fairly standard to fit the lens an average of 2 millimeters larger than the horizontal visible iris diameter to make sure that there is an adequate limbal coverage. Whatever method has brought success with single vision soft toric lenses is the method to continue with when determining base curve and diameter of soft toric lenses. But also as it is true with fitting spherical soft lenses, it is imperative to apply the diagnostic lens and evaluate the fit before making the final decision. Look for fluid movement, limbus to limbus coverage, and consistent rotation of the axis. The most challenging part of fitting a soft torque lens obviously isn't the physical fitting characteristics of the lens. Instead, it is determining what power to put in the lens. We'll work through this step by step to help clear up some of the confusion. The place to begin is the same as with all contact lens prescriptions. Put the spectacle refraction in minus cylinder. Our example starts with a refraction of minus six and a half plus one and a quarter axis 90. Transposing that into minus cylinder results in minus five and a quarter minus one and a quarter axis 180. The next step is also the same as in any contact lens prescription. It is necessary to vertex any amount of the prescription that is over plus or minus four diopters. Since the sphere portion of our example is minus five and a quarter, it will need to be vertexed. This results in a new prescription of minus five, minus one and a quarter, axis 180. So far so good. Now comes the part that is more specific for soft toric lenses. Step number three is to calculate the amount of lens rotation by viewing the markings and compensate for the rotation. Imagine the optics involved in a soft toric lens. Unlike a spherical lens in which the same prescription is delivered regardless of how the lens rotates on the eye, a soft toric lens needs to orient in a specific place and maintain a stable position in order to provide the spherocylindrical correction properly. But the lens is on a dynamic, moving environment and it is going to not only move, it might not position properly in the first place. Lid forces, corneal topography, the lens design will all affect the lens rotation. So, once a diagnostic lens is placed on the eye and allowed to settle, how that particular lens design positions needs to be evaluated and noted. Axis markings are found on every soft toric lens. These do not indicate where the axis is located on the lens, but rather they are used to help contact lens professionals determine how far off the lens is positioning. Then this rotation needs to be compensated for so that the final prescription matches the patient's needs. An important point to remember is that once this rotation is compensated for in the new refraction, the following lenses will all position the same way on the patient's eye. Lars is a good way to estimate how much to compensate the refraction, although we'll discuss a more accurate method in a bit. 
LARS stands for Left Add, Right Subtract, and simply remembering the acronym LARS is an easy way to remember the steps for axis rotation compensation. For the LARS method, you need to imagine the face of a clock, which is also a circle, just like the face of a contact lens. If you divide the 360 degrees of the circle, or clock, by the 12 hours, you find that every clock hour represents 30 degrees. If the axis markings are off of their expected position by a full clock hour, they are 30 degrees off axis. But we can fine tune this even more by dividing the 30 degrees in the clock hour by the 5 minutes. Every minute on the clock face then represents 5 to 6 degrees. Now all that needs to be done is to estimate the amount and direction of the rotation. If the axis markings position to the viewer's left, add that amount to the spectacle axis. So, if the axis markings are supposed to position at the 6 o'clock hour, but they instead position at the 7 o'clock, they are off 30 degrees, and that amount should be added to the patient's refractive axis. If the axis markings position to the viewer's right, subtract that amount from the spectacle axis. Now, if the axis markings are supposed to orient at the 6 o'clock hour, but they instead orient at 5 o'clock, the amount of rotation needs to be subtracted from the patient's refractive axis. Remember, the amount and direction of rotation is always determined from the fitter's point of view. Let's walk through an example. We've listed the original refraction of our example here at the top. Minus six and a half, plus one and a quarter, axis 90. If the axis marking orients 10 degrees, or about two minutes to the left of where it is supposed to be, as indicated by the manufacturer, add 10 degrees to the cylinder axis of the spectacle refraction. Remember, LAR stands for left, add, right, subtract. Our patient's minus cylinder, vertex compensated refraction, is minus five, minus one and a quarter, axis 180. But since the diagnostic lens has rotated 10 degrees to the left, we have to assume that it will always take this position. That means we have to compensate the ordered prescription so that when the patient's lens is placed on the eye, and it again rotates 10 degrees to the left, the final prescription will be the correct one. So in order to do this, the lens to be ordered is minus 5, minus 1 and a quarter, axis 10. Here's another example. We'll start again with the same prescription. But now the axis markings orient 10 degrees, or 2 minutes, to the right. So that makes it necessary to subtract 10 degrees from the cylinder axis of the spectacle refraction. The acronym LARS is left add, right subtract. This means that the lens to be ordered for the patient is now a minus five, minus one and a quarter, axis 170. While it doesn't very closely resemble the original refraction found at the top of the slide, this is the lens power that will provide the patient with the best vision in the chosen soft toric lens design. Another way to determine the final lens prescription is to perform a refraction over the lens and provide that information to the lens manufacturer to determine a new lens power. By knowing the parameters of the lens on the eye and the over-refraction results, a calculation can be made to determine the final parameters. This may provide a more accurate method of determining the final lens parameters, but not all contact lens professionals have this opportunity. Before we leave the subject of soft toric lenses, it is important to stress a few points about the follow-up of these commonly misunderstood lenses. It is important to remember that the same axis orientation should be expected from the ordered lens and the diagnostic lens. The ultimate goal is not to have the axis markings change position. So, it is very important to make a notation on the patient's chart as to the location of the axis markings for the particular lens design. Remember, recalculating the axis will not change where the markings are located. Soft toric lenses offer astigmatic patients another contact lens option. When patients say that they can't wear soft lenses because they have astigmatism, you can spread the good news that soft toric lenses are indeed a very successful option.